Uh, it's a pleasure and a delight to be with you all uh, on this fine morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me and who I am, uh, my name's Isaac, and I'm a deacon and pastoral intern uh, at Trinity Reformed Baptist in Maroa. Uh, if you'd like to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, we'll begin by reading the word of the Lord together. Um, our text for this morning uh, is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, but for the sake of context, uh, we'll begin in uh, the end of uh, verse 8. And verse 8b, uh, reading all the way through uh, to the end of verse 13. <clears throat> now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present... We do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering." For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's come before him now in prayer. Our heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you that you have gathered us here this morning. We thank you that you have gathered us here to sing praises to you, to join together uh, as a holy congregation, to hear your word preached. We ask that you would be merciful to us this morning, that you would uh, work in our hearts to bring about that which you desire and require of us. We ask uh, this morning that we would hear of your gospel that we have been saved by, the gospel that is as a sweet balm to our souls, uh, souls suffering under the weight of sin. I ask this morning that you would give me the words to say, that I would say that which you require uh, and desire for your people to hear and uh, nothing that uh, is unnecessary. And we ask that through the preaching of the gospel, you would draw us nearer to yourself uh, and that we may reflect Christ in our lives uh, more clearly each day by the work of your spirit. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we all come to scripture uh, with preformed thoughts of what things should be and of how we think that God should act. Thoughts of God always does this and he would never act like that. Yet time and time again, we see redemptive history unfolding in unusual, uh, in, in unusual ways that seem contrary to human nature and how we would like them to play out. We see that struggle in the disciples themselves. Having spent three years with Christ already and seeing him interpret the Old Testament properly, having witnessed many miracles to back up the, the, this message that he is preaching, and having seen and heard how the kingdom of God is not of this world, according to our principles, they still ask him, after he had been raised from the dead, defeating sin and death, they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now we may look at that now and scoff, thinking that we know better thinking that we would never ask such a question, having experienced all the same things, yet history has proven time and time again that this way of thinking still seems to seep into this church, that the kingdom of God is of this world. But this is the point that the author is trying to make to us this morning. This is what he's been getting at in the whole book of Hebrews, that the kingdom of God is not of this world, it does not succeed how we perceive success, despite the seemingly invisible and weak nature of things now. The kingdom of God is full of assurance of ultimate victory, both personally and corporately, due to the security of our salvation being bound up in the eternal God. The eternal God, immortal, invisible, 
gracious, wise, the God over all. Now, so far in the book of Hebrews, the author has taken us through the superiority of Christ over all things in chapter 1. He is the final word of God, it proclaims. He is the one through whom the whole world was created. He is the only begotten Son of God and the ruler over all things. Therefore, it now says to us that he is the one worthy of our worship and the one to whom we must cling. And so now we take a bit of a right turn. Because of all of these things that are true about Christ, he is the one Uh, who is worthy to be the founder and perfecter of our faith. And this is where we find our text this morning. Now, for all of these things being true about Christ, it is fitting that he be the forerunner who is perfected through suffering, that God uses to bring us the many sons to glory. That is what we are going to focus on this morning. Despite our many preconceived ideas, despite the way that we think about who God should be, and how we think he should be acting, God does not act according to our notions. And what I want us and what I want you to get out of this text this morning is that we would see, that you would see, the fittingness of Christ's sufferings and death for you as your forerunner and high priest, and that you would glorify God for his wisdom and grace. For God does not work according to our wisdom, but his own. And we'll look at this under three headings. Firstly, the fittingness of God. Oh, sorry. Firstly, the fittingness according to God. Secondly, the fittingness of Christ's perfection for our glorification. And thirdly, the fittingness of suffering as the path to glory. So again, that's the fittingness according to God. Fittingness of Christ's perfection for our glorification. And thirdly, the fittingness of suffering as the path to glory. Beginning uh, with the first point, fittingness according to God. I was having a conversation with a friend when I was discussing and thinking about this passage. What does it mean for something to be fitting, he asked. Think about a nice pair of shoes. What does it mean for them to be fitting? Or a suit or a dress? Now, I had the privilege when I got married of having my suit tailored. I'd bought a suit from the op shop and I took it to a tailor and they, they took it in and they crafted it to fit my body perfectly. And it was the best feeling, a perfectly fitting suit. Nothing tugged, nothing pulled, nothing hung weirdly. Everything fit just right. Nothing was out of place and was perfectly as it should be. And I'm sure you've had the same experience with just one piece of clothing. To slip on a pair of shoes or a jacket and it just fit perfectly. Not too tight, not too loose, no weird pressure points. Now it is the same idea here of fittingness that the author is trying to tell us of how God works his salvation. Rather than standing above the text and rather than standing over God, Assuming things about how he works, this phrase here in, uh, in verse 10, for it was fitting, reorientates our thoughts. It reorientates our thoughts to things that fit just right. No tugging, no pulling, no weird pressure points. For it was fitting. How we thought things should go, that there should be a physical kingdom, that we should have a physical victory, that Christ should bring a conquering kingdom, all of these are unfitting according to the wisdom of our Father. They are ill-fitting, like a shoe half a size too small, or a shirt that pulls under the armpit. So are our natural ideas of God's redemption, uh, of, so are our natural ideas of how, sorry, God's redemption should play out. Christ, the Son of God, tasted death for everyone by the grace of God. This is fitting. This is fitting. Why was it fitting, you may ask? Because the one through whom all things were created should and would have the wisdom and authority to cast, uh, to cause all things to ultimately glorify himself. The way that God gets glory is not how we would like to get glory. This is why it was fitting. When we picture glory, 
we picture vanquishing our enemies like Alexander the Great at the front of his enemies, leading them to victory. But when God pictures glory and he tells us of how he gets his glory, it is not like human glory. Rather than using the strong to conquer the weak, God, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 27, chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. In verse 31, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He does not at this time vanquish all his enemies, for we know that we, by nature, are enemies of God. Instead, the way that God gets glory is, re- is by redeeming those enemies to himself, to make a people for himself, and that in our whole beings would glorify God. Therefore, therefore, it is fitting that the one who brought creation into existence, who upholds all things, is also the one ultimately for whom all things exist. And if they exist for God, and we exist for God alone, then it is fitting for God to bring many sons to glory. Now this is who we are, and this is where we are going. We are going to glory. We are marked and sealed for this end. In our glorification, which is being completely made new, in the new heavens and the new earth, God is glorified. In this gracious work of God, that Christ should taste death for us, we see the heart of God on full display. As one commentator so beautifully put it, he said, It is in the passion of our Lord that we see the very heart of God laid bare. Nowhere is God more fully or more worthily revealed as God than when we see him in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now it is fitting that things would happen this way purely Because that through it, we get a glimpse into the glories of God's heart. God does not act according to our sensibilities. When we desire conquering, God sacrifices. Where we want power, God is humble. And the heart of God is that he is full of grace and love. And it is from this that he acts for us. Because all things come from God and they flow back to God, we can have ultimate trust in his work for us. That as he upholds the universe and he sustains it, so too he holds your life in his hands. Psalm 121, 3 to 4 says that he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. When we align our minds and when we align our desires and assumptions about God with how he has revealed himself, we see that in fact it is fitting that God for whom and by whom all things exist brings many sons to glory. Now how does God do this? How does God bring these many sons to glory? And why is that fitting for him? And this leads me to my second point. The fittingness of Christ's perfection for our glorification. Have you ever wondered how exactly Alexander the Great managed for such a long time to lead his soldiers on victory after victory? Years and years of campaigning, he managed to lead them and succeed. Pushing all the way out to India, he started in in, in Greece, if you Know the Mediterranean, he started over here and he worked his way all the way across the Middle East, all the way out to India. Thousands of miles from their homes and their families. How did he do this? How did he manage to keep morale up? How did he manage to succeed time and time again? And it was said that the way that his success came about was that he was able to do so because at every stage, Alexander the Great was at the head of his army. He was the pioneer. He was the one who was leading them on in victory. And his people were following behind him. And this is how the author to the Hebrews portrays Christ. That it says that he is to be, at the bottom of verse 10, the founder of their salvation. It was fitting that God should make Christ the pioneer of our faith. He does not do it by riding into battle, though, with an army. Rather... 
Christ does it by humbling himself and taking upon himself our human flesh. We who were made in the image of God, called to obey him and love him, have sinned, and we by nature are now incapable of glorifying God in the way that he requires of us. Now, because the Son of Man has come, because he has taken upon himself our body, our body of sin, he has now gone before us. He has now blazed a path through sin and death so that we might have salvation and be called sons of the living God. Now, in choosing to call him the founder of our salvation, we see another aspect of Christ's work for us. It is fitting that the Son of God be the one upon whom our salvation is built, because it is for whom and for him that everything exists, even our lives and our very faith. Making and proclaiming Christ the founder of all things achieves two things for us. Firstly, it results in praise and glory to God alone. For you see, we've been created for his glory, and now through the work of his Son, we not only have to live for his glory, but even our ability to do so is found in him alone. We do not boast in ourselves. We do not boast in our ability to do these things, but we boast in the Lord who has been gracious and merciful towards us. And the second thing that it achieves is that it means our entering into glory will not fail. Your entering into glory will not fail. The one who has gone before us, who has gone before you, is the Son of God. The one by whom God created all things. And has, as he has brought all things uh, created into existence by the word of his mouth, he now brings the new creation into existence by his eternal word, the Son. Because the Son is God, we can have surety that all things will work out according to his good purposes. He cares for you. He watches over you. He is your good shepherd. As David says in Psalm 23, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And because of these words, you can trust that he will do this, because the sovereign Lord over all the earth has gone before you. And now by him you have confidence to enter the throne room of your heavenly Father. The author says here that Christ is made perfect. It seems odd that Christ had to be made perfect. It seems odd that he would use these words to describe our heavenly divine saviour. So does this then imply that there is something lacking in Christ as the son of God? Does it imply that he had to make up something in his humanity and divinity that he was lacking? Not in any way. As chapter 1 verse 5 says, Christ is the only begotten son of God. For it says here, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This means that he is of the same substance as the father is. Such as the father is, such as the son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The perfection we are talking about here is not any perfection in his being, in his divinity or in his humanity, but what we are talking about here is not of a moral quality. It is not adding to or taking away any part of who Christ is. He is already and completely fully God. It is referring to instead the fact that he is the one who is the author of our salvation. And I found how one author summed it up helpful. He says that the perfect son of God has to be made his people's perfect saviour opening up their way to God. And in order to, order to become that, he must endure suffering and death. The pathway of perfection, which his people must tread, must first be trodden by the pathfinder, 
only so he could be the adequate representative and high priest in the presence of God. Now, this perfection of Christ for us as our pathfinder, as our perfecter, as our trailblazer has two benefits for us. It firstly means that Christ is able to sympathize with your weakness. He took on your flesh, and as he grew up, he grew in wisdom and stature. And although he was a son, he learned obedience through what was suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The fact that he grew as we grow, the fact that he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, means that we can go to him. And we can know that he knows our sins and our weaknesses. He knows your struggle to live a life glorifying to God. So then, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now secondly, the second benefit is that your perfection and righteousness are bound up in what Christ has earned for you. In his life that he lived for you and the obedience that he learned. He did, not do, he, did not, he did it so that by his death and his life, we have been washed clean. We have been made new. We have been credited with an obedience that is not ours and a righteousness that is not ours, but an obedience and a righteousness that is Christ's for us, that is Christ's for you. Just as Christ can sympathize with your weakness, he also intercedes for you and he says of you behold i have taken your iniquity away from you and i will clothe you with pure vestments now it is fitting for god to make him perfect for us so that we can have an assurance of a high priest who has offered himself as a pure sacrifice our motivation then in the christian life is not to earn any sort of standing with god your motivation for holy living is not so that God can look upon you in favor, for he has already looked upon you in favor in Christ alone. But our motivation then is to offer, our, offer up our lives as a spiritual sacrifice, glorifying him alone out of the love for him, for his boundless wisdom and grace. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. In all of his wisdom, God has ordained these things that would come about through suffering. And this brings me to my final point, the fittingness of Christ's suffering as the path to glory. Now these believers hearing this for the first time, they could feel the rising pressure around them from outside. It was, a, it was as though a noose was tightening in around them. They were small. They were weak, according to the world. This kingdom of God that they were a part of didn't seem as though it was succeeding in the way that they had thought. How could God, who is all-powerful and almighty and has redeemed us, allow these things to happen? How could we feel so small and so insignificant? Perhaps it may be easier to just go back to what was happening beforehand, what they were doing beforehand. There was much less adversity before they became Christians. Maybe this is not all worth it. So these Christians, they were experiencing many hardships and trials, and they're about to experience many, many, many more trials. They knew what was coming, and they were fearful for the future. Do you also feel like this? That maybe things as a Christian are just too hard. Maybe you suffer ridicule for being a Christian. Maybe your battles with sin don't seem to be going anywhere and you're tempted to just throw in the towel. But the author here gives us every reason to not throw in the towel. He says that our saviour and the founder of our faith was perfected through suffering. He says that, our, uh, that as Christ suffered and then entered into glory, that we will follow after him on that path of suffering leading to glory. Rather than it being how we are justified, our suffering is how we are crafted and how we are made into the likeness of Christ. It is the will of God that we would be sanctified because of the process of sanctification is this gradual refining of us and of making us holy. But notice, 
when it talks about the process of salvation, Romans 8.30, notice um, how Paul lays it out. He says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. In this golden chain of redemption, what do we find missing from this? We find sanctification missing. It is not that Paul ignores it. It is not that Paul says that sanctification is unimportant for the Christian life. But what he proclaims to us in our, in our uh, assurance and steadfastness and standing in Christ is that our grounds of assurance and the hope of glory we have is not based on how holy we get in this life. We are not sanctified in order that we may be glorified. According to this, it says that we are justified and will be glorified. It is based on how holy our Savior and our High Priest is. By his sufferings, we have been justified. Our path to glory, then, is not one that we should dread. It is not something to fear, for we know that our Savior faithfully leads and shepherds us. Amidst the trials of this life, the battles with sin, the seeming never-ending work of sanctification, all of these things are not indications that God has departed from you. He who keeps you will not slumber. Rather, he is bringing you into glory. This road of suffering that we experience in this life, whether great or small, are the means by which you should be sanctified after the image of your Saviour, Jesus Christ. We should then delight when trials and sufferings come our way, for they push us back to Christ, that we might spend each day at the foot of his cross, marveling at the grace and mercy and wisdom of God. We should not fear trials and the various crosses that we must bear. It is fitting that suffering leads to glory, because in the wisdom of God, he does not, do he does not delight in strength, according to us, but in weakness and humility. Suffering was the path that Christ walked so that he could be our faithful and high priest. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. This path you walk is well worn by the Savior who carved it out on his way to the cross. One day you will be united with him in glory. You will be made new. There will be no more sin in your body and there will be no more imperfection. But the full reality of the righteousness that Christ has clothed you in will be revealed. So now we can rejoice and glorify the one through whom we have present redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Come now to him, all you who are labor, who labor and are weary, and he will give you rest. In him is an abundance of grace. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you bestow upon us each day. We thank you for your word and the gospel that we find within it. We thank you for these words of comfort, that Christ has gone before us, that he is our founder and our perfecter, and that he now sits at your right hand as our high priest. We ask that these realities would be made, uh, made present realities for us now that we would live lives that are glorifying to you in all things and delight in you and your providence for us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for Christ. And we thank you for your wisdom in all things. We ask that through the work of your spirit, you would bring about these realities in our lives, that we may glorify you in our bodies. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.